Okay, um, so my paper is um, about halls and chambers going right back to the beginning, the uh, 12th to early 13th century. Uh, the earliest domestic buildings that we have in the UK, which survive above ground, date back to the 12th and early 13th century. This was a formative period for the English medieval house, laying the foundations for later developments. But the surviving evidence from this early period is very sparse in comparison with later periods. The surviving buildings are often fragmentary and puzzling, and there are few documentary sources to shed light on how the various spaces were used. This has given rise to much debate about our understanding of houses of the period, with some major shifts in our conceptual framework over the last few decades. So it's a very interesting area. I was drawn into it with a study of Oakham Castle, shown here, uh, 10 years ago, and it's become the subject of ongoing research for me. I should add that the surviving buildings are generally, of course, all of pretty high status and built mainly of stone rather than timber. But I think there's still plenty of interest here for those interested in the vernacular, as these high status houses were a key influence on the later development of buildings at all levels of society. Sorry, if I have... Am I showing this? Uh, maybe just kill that. Yeah. There we go. Um, so, um, in an important article of 1993, John Blair assembled a set of documentary references from the 12th century and before, which referred to the two principal components of any substantial residence the hall and the chamber. The documents make clear that the hall, or aula, was communal public and official used for activities such as the holding of courts or eating of formal meals. The chamber, on the other hand, or camera, was for private and residential use. Let's look first at two examples of ground floor halls. Here is the hall at Leicester Castle, our earliest standing aisled hall. It's recently been dendrodated to 1137 to 62, so it was probably built in the 1150s by Robert de Beaumont, second Earl of Leicester, one of the greatest magnates of the time. It was heavily altered in 1821 and before, but enough survives to allow reasonable reconstruction. It has, earlier, it has external work walls of stone, um, but the aisled structure inside is of timber. My recent cross-section draws on earlier work by Nat Alcock and Richard Buckley with arched timber arcading and a clear story, all lost before 1821. It had an entrance at one end, though not a cross passage, as the hall was built against the castle bailey wall. Two service doors at this end led into small attached service rooms. There was presumably a central open hearth with the Lord's table at the high end. The door behind the high table probably led out towards a detached chamber block. The second example of a ground floor hall is at Oakham Castle. It's a classic aisled hall, the most complete example in the UK dating from the 1180s. <clears throat> it has stone arcades with very fine ornamental carving. The entrance was originally at the low end to the east, though the doorway was moved to the centre in the 18th century. This was a cross entry again, rather than a fully developed cross passage with a rear door. There was presumably an open hearth in the centre with the high end and Lord's table at the west end. Plaster decoration with Romanesque Opus Reticulatum, that um, uh, cross hatched uh, area at the far end, has recently come to light, which formed the original 12th century backdrop for the high table. So the form of these grand ground floor halls, like other examples of the period, can be understood fairly readily. Often much more puzzling is the nature of the other chambers, which must have accompanied such halls, providing more private accommodation. At the low end of Oakham, there are three ground floor doorways leading to service rooms and the kitchen. But there's also a curious original doorway at first floor level. Detailed building analysis has indicated that there were hip lean-tos at both ends of the hall. A stair in the cross entry led up to the first floor doorway, giving access to a chamber over the service rooms. But this was a rather constricted space, quite unfitting as the principal chamber for such a fine hall. So it seemed there must have been a separate building for the principal chamber. <clears throat> Excavation eventually revealed the remains of this, accessed via a covered passageway from the doorway at the high end of the hall. 
Leicester also seems to have had an original separate chamber block beyond the high end of the hall. Leicester and Oakham then can be recognised as ground floor halls that have lost their chamber blocks. Elsewhere, a number of two-storey domestic buildings from the Norman period have long been recognised. It used to be thought that these were complete houses with a hall and chamber all on the first floor. But John Blair overturned this theory in his article of 1993. He argued that such buildings, rather than containing first floor halls, were detached chamber blocks, which had lost the halls that originally accompanied them. Boothby Pagnell is the classic and most complete example of this, presented by Margaret Wood and others earlier on as a first floor hall. It is now recognised as a chamber block and archaeological exploration has even identified a trace of the lost hall that originally accompanied it. Boothby Pagnell, like various other examples of chamber blocks, has a vaulted undercroft with small windows for storage. An external staircase long demolished led up to the main entrance at first floor level. There was a principal chamber with good windows and a fine surviving Norman fireplace and an unheated chamber beyond. Here's another example of a detached chamber block at Hemingford Grey Manor House. We visited uh, this building on the VAG conference of 2007 and I've recently completed an investigation and published an article on it. It's lost one gable wall but the plan can be re reconstructed fairly well. The entrance door was at first floor level in the end gable. The location of the fireplace shows that here there was only a single chamber with no subdivision. A number of two light Norman windows survive. Only the chamber block remains with no evidence of a hall. But the location of the chamber block to one side of the large moated platform leaves plenty of space for a former hall that surely must have been there. After John Blair's article of 1993, there was a tendency to deny the existence of any halls at first floor level and assume that all of these early two-storey domestic buildings were chamber blocks. However, <clears throat> Mark Gardner and myself recently undertook a reassessment and published an article in 2018 arguing for the recognition of first floor halls as a distinct and recognisable building type, albeit relatively rare. The starting point for our research was Scollins Hall at Richmond Castle in Yorkshire. This is a remarkably early building of the late 11th century, which survives in surprisingly complete form. External stairs rose up to an impressive arched entrance doorway at the low end of the first floor hall. The surviving walls and beam sockets show that there was no wall fireplace, so there must have been a central open hearth supported on timber joists. Although unusual, Fabric evidence for open hearths on timber floors has been found elsewhere, the timber protected by stone slabs. At the high end of the hall, beyond the Lord's table, a door led through on the same level to a chamber. Here, there was a wall fireplace <clears throat> and a doorway to a balcony with views over an adjoining garden. The guardrobe tower completed this remarkably well integrated suite of rooms. Some have suggested that the main first floor space was a chamber rather than a hall, but the size of the room, the existence of a good inner chamber and the lack of a wall fireplace all indicate that it was a hall. We assembled over a dozen examples of first floor halls from this period. Ainsford Castle in Kent is a good example, another very early building dating from around 1100. Although ruined with only parts of the ground floor surviving, Enough remains to indicate some of the principal features. The main part of the ground floor was an undercroft with narrow windows, clearly for storage. Above was the first floor hall, entered from one end via a staircase. The floor was of timber, but here a stone pier supported the central hearth. The pier had been enlarged in the 13th century after a fire, quite probably caused by a problem with the open hearth and its adjoining timber floor. An internal stair connected the hall to the undercroft. At the high end of the hall was a chamber, possibly with an original wall fireplace. The lack of space for a separate ground floor hall within the encircling castle walls proves that this was here a first floor hall, not a chamber block. Set within the strong encircling walls of the castle bailey, the hall might easily have been placed at ground floor level. 
the decision to locate it on the first floor was clearly not guided by the need for defence. The undercroft was remarkably tall, around six metres from floor to ceiling. The first floor hall was set high above the bailey with an impressive stair of approach. The extra height would have made it visible above the castle walls to approaching visitors and allowed views out. Whether on the ground floor or on the first floor, the contrast in use and character of the hall and chamber can be clearly distinguished. The hall was of course always much more spacious than the chamber to allow for large public gatherings. In 1099, when inspecting his vast new hall at Westminster, William Rufus is reported to have said that it was too big for a chamber and not big enough for a hall. A bragging jest, but a jest based on a common understanding of the different spatial requirements. Wide spans could be achieved more readily in halls placed on the ground floor with aisled arcades. Halls had a much more distinctive hierarchy with entry at the low end and the high table at the other end. At this early period, the hall was where the medieval household came together every day for meals. There are very few contemporary records to show the use of the hall and chamber. One very useful source is the rules of Bishop Gross Test of Lincoln of around 1240. He gives advice on how to manage a great aristocratic estate, including use of the hall. He says, make your own household to sit in the hall as much as you may and sit you ever in the middle of the high board that your visage and cheer be showed to all men. The hall was the center of the feudal society where the place of each person was regularly demonstrated and affirmed. Halls of the elite involved considerable ceremony, but the key principles seem to have been repeated right down the social scale. Records show that ritual and ceremony grew more extensive and complex in the later Middle Ages, but the pattern was already well established at this earlier period. The chamber was a more private space for the Lord and Lady of the house to withdraw to. Use of the chamber as a bedroom for sleeping in was obviously a core function, but chambers were also used in other ways. Gross test advises that the Lord should only have meals in the chamber rather than the hall in case of sickness or fatigue. His 23rd rule says, forbid dinners and suppers out of the hall in secret and in private rooms, for from this arises waste and no honour to the Lord and Lady. But the fact that Gross Test had a rule against such a practice does show that privileged members of the household might, even at this early period, be dining in more private company in a chamber rather than in a hall. In our study of first floor halls, we came to realise that one of the defining characteristics as to whether a, hall, a room was a hall or a chamber was the nature of the fireplace. With very few exceptions, early halls had an open hearth placed near the centre of the space. Conversely, fireplaces in chambers were always located against the wall with a chimney stack. Given the practical disadvantages of an open hearth, especially one placed at first floor level, a special symbolic value must have been accorded to the fire open on all sides at the centre of the room and with smoke rising to the rafters. The central fire must have acted as a key focal point in the hall in its formal public and communal function, while the wall fireplace was appropriate for less formal and private uses. The open hearth was evidently a key signifier of social space. It had an enduring attraction for the English, where it was retained into the 16th century and beyond. Despite the shared Anglo-Norman heritage, it's interesting to note that the open hearth is extremely rare in France, even at this early period. Perhaps the English attachment to the open hearth has earlier Anglo-Saxon roots. The different roles of the hall and chamber are brought to life in the chivalric romance of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Although written in the later 14th century, it looks back to an earlier age. The hall is the centre each evening of public feasting. This wonderful phrase, much glam and glee, glint up therein. The open hearth on the flat floor of the hall, the fire upon flat, as is, is specifically mentioned twice in Sigawin. After the joyous feasting in the hall, the visitor Garwin is taken by his host to a chamber where they sit by a fireplace, drink and converse. The chamber is mentioned on three consecutive evenings, each time in close association with the chimney. 
the chamber and its wall fireplace with a chimney are treated here as synonymous, as it says there in the last line, and to the chimney they passed. Garwin later proceeds to his own bedchamber with its bed, curtains, and also a chimney. It must have been a chilly business being a lord in an English open hall. No doubt one of the incentives for withdrawing to a cosier chamber beside a fireplace. At Oakham Castle, although the chambers have been lost, the fine sculpture in the hall with a variety of figures playing instruments are probably a reflection of the music that accompanied great feasts. Courtly life of this nature is described by Chrétien de Troyes around 1170. In a different, more sober role, Oakham's hall was used as a courtroom. The earliest surviving record of court usage is from 1229. When the Court of Civil Pleas was held in the hall in 1253, it's interesting to note that the judges withdrew to a separate chamber to agree the fines payable. Another rare contemporary source for this early period is a text by the English scholar Alexander Neckham, written in the late 12th century. He describes the contents of various rooms. The hall receives only brief treatment, mainly about the structure, with posts dividing the space into bays. But the contents of the chamber are given at great length. The bed is surrounded by curtains. Neckham says to keep the flies and spiders out here. There are lavish drapes, bedclothes and soft furnishings. A chair is mentioned and a small stool, though no implements for a fireplace. There are rods on which to hang a whole variety of clothes and even another rod for the hunting falcons to perch on. <clears throat> of particular interest though um, is this list of equipment. Um, needles, scissors and thread for sewing and embroidery work. Here is a rare clue that the chamber was also an important space for the lady of the household to withdraw to, not only at night, but during the daytime, and no doubt with female companions. We've looked at examples where the hall and chamber block were detached independent structures. In another early type, there was a good sized attached uh, chamber on the first floor above the services. Here at Warnford in Hampshire, there was a stair at the end of the cross entry. Unlike the similar arrangement at Oakham, the stair here led up to a good quality chamber with a fireplace, a guard robe and an inner room. But it's possible that there was a larger principal chamber located beyond the high end of the hall and accessed via a door beside the dais. A similar but much grander example can be seen at the Bishop's Palace at Bishop Auckland. Here, a curious stair led out from the cross passage and turn back to enter a room above the services, now lost. A door at the high end led off to a detached chamber block. The detached chamber block would eventually become fully integrated with the hall to form the classic and long-lasting tripartite plan form with hall, solar and services. This example at Nassington in Northamptonshire shows an intriguing halfway stage with a semi-detached chamber block. Although the chamber block was lost around 1800, evidence survives to show some of its key features. It was attached to the gable end of the hall, but there was no internal access. Instead, a door led outside from the high end of the hall, so there must have been an external staircase leading up to the first floor chamber. Another type of Norman domestic building was the townhouse. In a study of 1994, Roland Harris identified 71 Romanesque townhouses in England, though most survive only in a fragmentary state. Here's one of the best known, the Jews House in Lincoln. On the ground floor were three shop units with large shuttered openings to the street. A passage led through to a staircase at the rear, giving access to the first floor chamber with its prominent chimney stack. There's been debate on whether this house and other townhouses of this early period had an open hall to the rear, with evidence for such strength structures lacking. My last example is another townhouse which I've recently studied, the so-called School of Pythagoras in Cambridge. This had a fine vaulted undercroft and a large chamber above, approached by a lost stone stair. With evidence for two fireplaces, there was clearly a main chamber and inner chamber with a further small room beyond. 
Unlike the Lincoln House, set on a busy shopping street, the building was located on a more spacious site outside the town centre. Earlier research, though, showed that it faced onto a former waterway, an important commercial wharf for Cambridge. It was built by Hervey Dunning, a leading merchant and Cambridge's first mayor. The large undercroft, with its slit windows, seems to have provided warehouse storage. <clears throat> sorry, um, seems to have provided uh, warehouse storage um, with a fine suite of rooms above. So is this building a first floor hall or a chamber block? <clears throat> Was there an accompanying ground floor hall which has since disappeared? We don't know, but we can use the developing research in this field to make some suggestions. The wall fireplace indicates that this was a chamber rather than a first floor hall with an open hearth. The large size of the principal chamber and the provision of an inner chamber, also heated, suggest that this was a complete set of accommodation, the only additional building required being a detached kitchen. Crucially, the building was not the centre of a manorial estate and no courts were held here. As a merchant, Hervey Dunning had no need to accommodate a feudal retinue around a communal open hearth. Instead, it seems his fine large chamber with its wall fireplace provided a different sort of space, more suited for the reception of his fellow burgesses. It would be some centuries before the rural English house took the same path. Thank you.